Welcome to Tent Talk, the podcast with Nancy McCrady, where we talk about life under the big tent of God's presence and the provoking process of discipleship. Here we go. Hey everybody, welcome to Tent Talk. This is Nancy McCrady and greetings from Norway. We are shifting in our summer readings series and shifting to the book Spiritual Leadership by J. Oswald Sanders. We will return in future episodes to Life Together by Diedrich Bonhoeffer, but now we will spend a little bit of time gleaning from some very rich and provoking reading from this uh, book. So I wanted to alert you to that. I hope that you are taking time also to share the podcast with others. And one of the things, if you really believe what we're doing here on Tent Talk Podcast and in Nancy McCready Ministries is worth uh, something, if you find it valuable to you, then maybe you would find it valuable to share with others. We want to ask that you would take about two minutes of your life and that you would not only share us on social media, but that you would also take time to give us a five-star rating and to write a review. Whenever this begins to happen more and more, then uh, uh, tech algorithms and all of that begin to pick us up more and help us to get the message out. So could we be just a little bit more savvy in a proper way to get the message out that you would take the time? I know there are many of you out there that you could take time to write a one, two, three sentence review, post it, uh, give us a five-star rating, and this will help a Tent Talk podcast to be picked up and moved into more areas where people can see us on uh, platforms and within social media worlds, if you will. So could you do that for us? I would greatly appreciate it and enjoy this next section of summer readings. Love you all. I want today to bring a few thoughts to you from a book that I've been reading over the years by J. Oswald Sanders, and the title of the book is Spiritual Leadership. Now, without reading the introduction or saying too much about the author, I want to go straight into chapter one, An Honorable Ambition, and I want to share um, some thoughts from this book here in our summer readings series. So here we go. Chapter one, an honorable ambition. To aspire to leadership is an honorable ambition. First Timothy 3.1. Should you then seek great things for yourself? Seek them not. Jeremiah 45.5. Most Christians have reservations about aspiring to leadership. They are unsure about whether it is truly right for a person to want to be a leader. After all, is it not better for the position to seek out the person rather than the person to seek out the position? Has not ambition caused the downfall of several otherwise great leaders in the church, people who fell victim to the last infirmity of noble minds? Shakespeare expressed a profound truth when his character, Wolseley, said to the great English general, Cromwell, I charge thee, fling away ambitions. By that sin fell the angels. How can a man then, the image of his maker, hope to profit by it? No doubt Christians must resist a certain kind of ambition and rid it from their lives. But we must also acknowledge other ambitions as noble, worthy, and honorable. The two verses at the beginning of this chapter provide a warning and an encouragement for sorting out the difference. When our ambition is to be effective in the service of God, to realize God's highest potential for our lives, we can keep both of these verses in mind and hold them in tension. Part of that tension is the difference between Paul's situation and ours. We may understand his statement in terms of the prestige and respect given to Christian leaders today, but such was far from Paul's mind. In his day, a bishop faced great danger and worrisome responsibility. Rewards for the work of leading the church were hardship, contempt, and rejection. The leader was the first to draw fire in persecution, the first in line to suffer. Seen in this light, Paul's encouragement does not seem so open to misuse by people merely seeking status in the church. 
phonies would have little heart for such a difficult assignment. Under the dangerous circumstances which prevailed in the first century, even stout-hearted Christians needed encouragement and incentive to lead. And so Paul called leadership an honorable ambition. The same situation faces Christians today in certain parts of the world. Leaders of the church in China suffered most at the hands of communists. The pastor of the little flock in Nepal suffered years in prison after church members had been released. In many troubled areas today, spiritual leadership is no task for those who seek stable benefits and upscale working conditions. Paul urges us to the work of leading the church, the most important work in the world. When our motives are right, this work pays eternal dividends. In Paul's day, only a deep love for Christ and genuine concern for the church could motivate people to lead. But in many cultures today where Christian leadership carries prestige and privilege, people aspire to leadership for reasons quite unworthy and self-seeking. And so Jeremiah gave Baruch some very wise and simple counsel. Quote, Should you then seek great things for yourself? Seek them not. Close quote. Jeremiah 45.5 The prophet was not condemning all ambition as sinful, but he was pointing to selfish motivation that makes ambition wrong. Great things for yourself. Desiring to be great is not a sin. It is motivation that determines ambition's character. Our Lord never taught against the urge to high achievement, but he did expose and condemn unworthy motivation. All Christians are called to develop God-given talents, to make the most of their lives, to develop to the fullest their God-given powers and capacities. But Jesus taught that ambition that centers on the self is wrong. Speaking to young ministers about to be ordained, the great missionary leader, Bishop Stephen Neal, said, I am inclined to think that ambition in any ordinary sense of the term is nearly always sinful in ordinary men. I am certain that in the Christian it is always sinful, and that it is most inexcusable of all in the ordained minister. Close quote. Ambition that centers on the glory of God and welfare of the church is a mighty force for good. The word ambition comes from a Latin word meaning campaigning for promotion. The phrase suggests a variety of elements, social visibility and approval, popularity, peer recognition, the exercise of authority over others. Ambitious people in this sense enjoy the power that comes with money and authority. And Jesus had no time for such ego-driven ambitions. The true spiritual leader will never campaign for promotion. To his ambitious disciples, Jesus announced a new standard of greatness. Quote, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. Mark 10, 42-44 We will consider this amazing statement in a later chapter. At the outset of any study of spiritual leadership, this master principle must be squarely faced. True greatness, true leadership, is found in giving yourself in service to others, not in coaxing or inducing others to serve you. True service is never without cost. Often it comes with a painful baptism of suffering. But the true spiritual leader is focused on the service he and she can render to God and other people, not on the residuals and perks of high office or holy title. We must aim to put more into life than we take out. One of the outstanding ironies of history is the utter disregard of ranks and titles and the final judgments men pass on each other, said Samuel Bringle, the great Salvation Army revival preacher. The final estimate of men shows that history cares not an iota for the rank or title a man has borne or the office he has held, but only the quality of his deeds and the character of his mind and heart. Let it once be fixed that a man's ambition is to fit into God's plan for him, and he has a north star ever in sight to guide him steadily over any sea, however shoreless it seems, wrote S.D. Gordon in one of his well-known devotional books. He has a compass that points true in the thickest fog and fiercest storm and regardless of magnetic rocks. Close quote. 
the great leader Count Nicholas von Zinzendorf in the 1700s of the Moravians was tempted by rank and riches. Indeed, he is most widely known by the title of honor noted here, Count. But his attitude toward ambition was summed up in one simple statement. I have one passion. It is he, he alone. Zinzendorf turned from self-seeking to become the founder and leader of the Moravian Church. His followers learned from their leader and circled the world with his passion. Before missionary work was popular or well organized, the Moravians established overseas churches which had three times as many members as did their churches back home, a most unusual accomplishment. Indeed, one of every 92 Moravians left home to serve as a missionary. Now this is a quote to close out the chapter. Because we children of Adam want to be great, he became small. Because we will not stoop, he humbled himself. Because we want to rule, he came to serve. So we see there, of course, the um, distinction between being in Adam and then becoming born again in Christ. Wow. (laughs) I am being moved as I have read this again. You know, I, I see here the comments of the Moravians out of Hernhut, Germany in the 1700s. One of the great goal assignment directives of NMM is to win for the Lamb the rewards of his suffering. This was one of the mottos of the Moravians. I'm stirred today and I pray you are. In our next episode, I'm going to read from chapter 2 of this same book. So, Think on these things, my friends, and let us be deeply provoked by the words of Scripture, by the words of those who have gone before us. But, my friends, it is so that we will step into our calling, which is to Him and Him alone. And then as we respond to our calling, we come to Him, we live in oneness with Him, He will direct our assignments It will then and only then make sense of why we have been given any giftings whatsoever. Oh, my friends. To be true leaders is to enter in for ourselves and then to become big open doors for other people to get to him and for him to be able to have them. Hmm? All right, my friends, here we go. Love you all. Enjoy your summer. For more information on Nancy, please visit nancymccrady.com or follow her on social media at nbmccrady.